All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. I think we can get going. It looks like we got a pretty good turnout for a Friday, a sunny Friday afternoon. Uh, my name is Glenn Sarvati from the uh, TAG FinTech Society uh, Steering Committee, um, and want to thank you all for taking the time to join us. I uh, want to thank TAG also for some uh, pretty impressive pivoting to uh, put these uh, virtual panels together on uh, pretty short notice. This is a re relatively new initiative, and I, I, I know Rebecca Markison is on from TAG, and uh, a fair number of these have been going on, have been uh, going quite well. Uh, we also kind of pivoted with this panel. We are still hoping, I think uh, we'll see what happens. We still have on the calendar a lunch and learn for Friday, June 5th, I guess five weeks from today, to do something quite similar. The original topic was going to be how banks and fintechs can work better together in terms of their relationships. But obviously, given what's been going on in the marketplace, we saw an even better opportunity to get uh, more specifically granular about how banks and fintechs are stepping up together against, uh, you know, kind of the joint forces for the common purpose of figuring out how we can uh, best address the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, serve customers and uh, move everybody forward. So that'll be the conversation for today. Just a couple other quick housekeeping items. We'll do a Q&A at the end. So uh, you, uh, you should have a, a chat uh, opportunity to, uh, to add it, anything into the, uh, to the box and we'll, uh, We'll ask questions. If you have them along the way, uh, please enter them as well. And if, uh, if appropriate, we can try to work them into the, uh, the conversation. A couple of other things to mark your calendar. As you know, we had to uh, postpone our FinTech South event at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, which uh, was originally scheduled for late April. Uh, mark your calendars. We are supposed to be doing it, uh, everything uh, continuing on path, hopefully, for uh, early October, the first week of October. That's already listed out there on the TAG website. If you've already registered, your uh, registration should have automatically transferred, and you'll be seeing more information on that uh, as the next couple of uh, weeks and months go on. Uh, and in general, just uh, keep a, a look. As I said, we've been quite a few of these uh, virtual events going on here with, uh, with TAG, both for FinTech and for other topics of, of interest as well. Uh, just uh, check the website. Um, they're uh, very affordable and uh, coming up fairly regularly. So uh, keep, keep tabs on those. With no further ado, let me uh, introduce Austin Mills. He's a partner at Morris Manning & Martin, a law firm that's very heavily involved in the FinTech space here in the Atlanta and the Southeast region. Uh, Austin very specifically has a FinTech focus to his um, client base, uh, both uh, technology companies overall, FinTech companies, and uh, blockchain and distributed ledger. With that, let me pass the mic to Austin, who will lead us through, I think, what is a very, very good panel and should be a great discussion. Yes. Thank you, Glenn, and, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I think we, we do have a great panel today with leading representatives from both the banking and FinTech communities. Uh, I'll introduce each of our panelists briefly and allow them to provide a bit more information on their background themselves. So maybe first, um, we have Didi Wakefield, CEO of Allegent. Didi, do you want to give a little more of your background? Sure. Hi, uh, Didi Wakefield, CEO of Allegent. Allegent's a um, software company headquartered at Peachtree Corners. We provide banks and credit unions with deposit automation, item processing, digital banking solutions, and uh, content management products. Um, have been around about 19 years um, collectively amongst a, a number of um, companies we've put together. And we are um, a, a private equity owned company, um, Battery Ventures out of Boston is our, is our sponsor. Um, and yeah, I'm just uh, I'm happy to be here today. Thanks. Thanks, Didi. Uh, we also have Jonathan Cook, president of Greenlight. Hey guys, yeah, uh, Johnson Cook. I'm a co-founder of a Greenlight Financial Technology. Uh, Greenlight is about a uh, five-year-old company based in Atlanta. We're a direct-to-consumer uh, product and company that is uh, very much on a mission. Our mission is to help parents raise financially smart kids. So we do that today with a debit card for kids that parents control from their phones. And uh, we uh, are on a roll. We're having a lot of fun. All being direct to consumer, I think a rare company for Atlanta. Um, we've raised about $82 million. The team is about 150 now. And uh, it's been an exciting time to continue hiring and onboarding even while we're sheltering in place. So uh, exciting times and, and love to talk about this stuff. Thanks, Johnson. Uh, we also have Nathan Meyer from Truist, uh, SVP, Division Head, Next Gen Product Innovation and DCIO Business. Please obviously correct me if I messed up any of your title but <laughs> no that's fine there's a few things going on there but the the primary focus is uh technology innovation strategy uh which is i think what we'll be talking about here 
Um, looking forward to being part of the panel and talking about not only how we at Truist are responding to COVID, but uh, what we're doing from a FinTech partnership to drive that forward and, and hearing from the other people on, on the panel. Um, so it should be a good chat. Thanks, Nathan. We also have uh, Nathan Ottinger of Atlantic Capital Bank, Senior Vice President, Payments and FinTech Industry Banking. Nathan. Yeah, great. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, it was an opportunity to put on a collared shirt today. So, uh, so thank you to TAG and the TAG FinTech team for, for doing that. Um, I run our, our payments and FinTech practice for Atlantic Capital Bank. And what that means is uh, the clients that I work with are in the FinTech or payment space. Um, and we work with FinTech and payments clients all around the country. And um, typically, the common thread is that we're moving money for these clients. So Atlantic Capital Bank is a, is a large ACH processor. We are moving consumer funds. We are moving corporate funds from point A to point B. And we have an area of, of specialty and expertise around that. Um, Atlantic Capital Bank is headquartered here in Atlanta. We're about a $3 billion um, asset size bank public. And um, again, thanks for the opportunity to, to, uh, to share today. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, maybe we'll get started on the fintech side of the aisle here. So Johnson and Didi, I think you both offer interesting perspectives in running fintech companies that interface directly with consumers and FIs, respectively. Can each of you weigh in on, on what changed for you in mid-March as this all sort of came about or, or when precisely things did start to change? And how do you find that your customers' expectations may have shifted um, as a result of all of this? So Didi, we can start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, from um, from Algen's perspective, um, you know, mid March, what what started to change was really that um, our customers started to look to us from a more consultative perspective as they were starting to see their consumers, their um, their their members, um, specifically at the at the credit unions we support, their members starting to um, to need to do more online, either by adopting the digital banking solutions that we provide to them in um, a more fulsome way, or in some cases, um, assisting them with figuring out how to reduce footprints in the branches and allow their employees to work from home while still being able to access um, the technology to do the deposit automation and item processing that they otherwise would have normally done. So, um, so it, it, we've always been a cons consultative, you know, Kind of company as it relates to working on solutions with our with our customers, but it's become more so in the last eight weeks um, as some of them just weren't ready for this uh, the amount of volume that was going to happen. Um, and now the 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 shift is turning to you know well is this is this a sea change shift or was it a spike? And and you know I think there will be a step function change in how. Their members and their and their customers work with them but then so then what does that then mean for how they are going to then potentially need to change their operations to support that so it sense uh, johnson some question to you what, what changed for you when this all came about and how did your customers expectations expectations shift yeah i think um <clears throat> what what's exciting to green light is you know i think the theme i keep hearing a lot is about this this is accelerating uh, changes that were already in motion. Um, I, it, it almost feels like I hope I'd like to maybe say green light was one of those changes already in motion that is accelerating now. Um, there are a couple of elements at play for us. Um, yes, kids spending. Uh, so our average age of our um, hundreds of thousands of kids is, is around 13 or 14 years old. And yes, their number one place to spend has always been fast food. So clearly they're not going out to eat fast food. They are ordering a lot of Domino's and Grubhub and DoorDash. Um, and they also are um, increasing their spend on online gaming. So every online gaming we're seeing like 50% week over week like continues to go up. So it's not quite making up in the dollar volume but the transaction volume is certainly uh, maintaining. The other thing that we are seeing is parents being stuck at home with their kids right now are desperate for things to engage with their kids. So content, ideas, a lot of people use Greenlight as a chores app or allowances or just get the kids to do something around the house uh, to save up for their car or their puppy or whatever they're saving up for, their new phone um, in Greenlight. And so our daily new family enrollments uh, between March and April have went up about 
a 40%, I would guess. Like, I mean, it is just a, a sharp, sharp, sharp increase in, in the growth of the top line of the company. Um, so, so very strong. And then also <laughs> cancellations were low to begin with, but nobody is canceling something that their kids can use right now. Uh, that's only four ninety nine a month. So I think it's, it's nothing but tailwinds for us on the bank partnership side. We don't have any, um, commercial bank partnerships uh, in the market yet. We do have some banks that are working on distributing Greenlight through their bank app. And of course, we, we immediately felt like, oh, this is all gonna seize up and the banks are just gonna, you know, just lock everything down and all resources are gonna go to something. Um, that has not been the case. I think the banks have heard the trends that we're seeing and they're now equally excited to accelerate getting a product like ours or in our case, our product into their app so that parents can be opening the bank app to assign chores and allowances to their kids. So another opportunity to engage with the parent customers and also start to build a relationship with the children is what the banks see. So yeah, um, knock on wood, so far we are seeing, you know, hopefully permanent shifts uh, in the business. Well, that's, that's great. Um, that's, uh, that's good to hear. Uh, Nathan Meyer, am I correct to say that your primary, your role primarily interfaces with FinTech partners and in-house developers creating FinTech solutions? Um, how do you how do you see things changing and and was it more uh, with partners or in house and can you also speak to sort of your your customer expectations toward uh, toward your bank? Yeah, uh, happy to. The first thing I would like to point out is like the Chick Fil A near my house is still open. So I don't know about Johnson's kids that he's got there. They no longer go to fast food because I have not had a problem with spicy chicken sandwich. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just just important to bring that out um yeah i think about the role one of the things that i, I definitely do at, at truest is we are taking through uh, not only the partners that we work with but more broadly about what do we want our technology innovation strategy to be um and once we've really agreed and framed on that then i think you can start working through um partners and talent and things that you're doing well and, and areas that you may have gaps. So one of the things that we have focused on and really started to think about as we come together as SunTrust and BBNT uh, to form Truist is um, where do we want to go from an innovation perspective and um, how do we want to partner with the larger FinTech community? So one of the things that COVID has done, I think really presented um, both an opportunity and force the hand of many banks, not just us, is uh, even if you think about PVP, you know, how quickly can banks scale at the level of lending that we're being required to do today? And for uh, you know, a large bank like us, it's not just being able to push funds out the door. I think in many ways we can do that fairly quick. I wouldn't say fairly quickly, but we've got the capitalization to push out funds if we needed to. The problem is you have to actually be able to ingest all of the forms all the applications uh, and just the volume that we're seeing on an ongoing basis and be able to sort through those applications and understand who those clients are and how do you get money out there out to them quickly. And historically, I think banks have been in a place where you are expecting a certain amount of volume over certain times of the year where it ramps up and ramps down. And in this case, um, you know, you have to really figure out about are there people in the larger fintech community, if you are having trouble with volume, that you can partner with really quickly to uh, be able to accept that uh, the loan applications um, and get stuff out the door. So it's forced partnerships that may have been explored and kind of push them up on, if you wanted to say from the agile terminology, the backlog to make sure that we're getting the stuff out the door more quickly. So I think just on the very specifics that we're dealing with today, we've really started to seek out who we can partner with now um, to make us more effective for our clients. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. And I think we're gonna announce more and more about what that partnership model will look like both in Atlanta and Charlotte as we, uh, as we get closer to it. And the second thing about the customer expectations, I think the reality is uh, similarly to how we've had to handle a lot of loan volume, um, we've also had to do this grand experiment where overnight um, all of our clients were interacting with us digitally. And if you think about banks historically, once again, we typically have ledgers and core banking platforms that are mainframe and they can't really handle um, a lot of the 
even if it's just checking your mobile application on an ongoing basis to see if you got that PPP loan, that volume has impact on mainframe technology that is difficult to handle. And so I think us and banks broadly are trying to think about now we know that we are truly in the digital age. We may have thought about it, we may have played around the edges, but it's here. And our clients expect us to be able to deliver an experience in that space that they see at an Amazon or they see it on, on Google or wherever else they may be and be able to translate where they stand financially within their on their hand or on their laptop or wherever it may be. And so banks really have got to refocus efforts and driving towards that client expectation that they're going to have moving forward. That's great. I appreciate that. Nathan, now, um, that you tend to work with portfolio of FinTech clients as borrowers, account holders, processes, et cetera, I believe. Um, what types of calls have you been fielding as, as the coronavirus is? Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of thinking back, you know, kind of early March, mid-March, when this really started to get real. Um, we kind of galvanized our team around this idea of the bank as an economic first responder. And we didn't exactly know what that was going to mean. Um, that was before PPP was announced and, and, and other things. But we knew that there's going to be a lot of angst, a lot of questions, and really try to figure out a different way of, of doing things. So we kind of came up with the idea of, okay, what would the Red Cross do if a tornado hit? What would their first kind of day one, hour one actions be and kind of worked forward from, from there? And so as it relates to you know, kind of the, the FinTech and, and payments business, that first hour activity was really around consistency of operations. Um, we, we move a lot of money and um, our clients are dependent day in and day out on those money movements not being interrupted. And we talk about being kind of the plumbing of, of many, many FinTechs that, that we work with. And so we needed to make sure that we could do that all in a remote manner pretty much overnight. Um, so that's really where we started kind of our journey was around, okay, consistency of operations and, and um, you know, what that looked like for us um, as, as teammates at, at the bank and for our clients. And, and that was a kind of a scary effort. And, um, you know, we, we um, um, they were very kind of pleased kind of how all of that went and the plumbing didn't seize up. Um, then kind of once we got kind of past kind of the consistency of operations, we kind of started talking about accessibility. And um, that accessibility was everything from internal accessibility between kind of our, our line teams and our operations teams, but also our customers to our relationship managers. And making sure that kind of we had the tools and, and, and technology in place to be able to efficiently do that. So that was really kind of the second step um, of, of, of this kind of economic first responder idea. And then finally, it, it was then kind of moved to, okay, how do we deliver assistance? And, you know, kind of during this time, the PPP was, was starting to be formulated, um, and formulated as in quotes and loosely used, but, um, um, you know, that, that process was, was starting to happen. And then uh, we were certainly working with, with borrowers around, okay, what's this mean for your business? Um, looking at loan restructurings and doing that kind of in a mass way. And um, that was kind of our <laughs> stair step of, of process when, when, you know, all of us um, had to recalibrate what we did on a daily basis back in, in, in March. Yeah, I bet. I bet. And so, I mean, um, before we, uh, for both Nathan's, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but obviously a, a very big topic in the current environment. Um, but are you guys able to shed any light on, on how you have been approaching the, the Paycheck Protection Program? Uh, I'll jump in and, and then certainly defer <laughs> to my other Nathan on the, on the panel. Um, you know, I, I'd like to say it was this well thought out, smooth process that, um, you know, we, we completely anticipated, you know, it certainly was not. And we went at it with a lot of brute force rather than, you know, these, these slick technology tools that, that we might have. Um, you know, our bank, um, you know, 3 billion asset size bank, 
not gigantic. So um, you know, we could quickly assemble the cross-functional teams needed to really kind of make this thing work. And, and that was probably the most challenging. You know, these PPP loans touched every area within the bank. So how do you quickly assign tasks and, and responsibility across an entirely new program that is completely undefined um, in a very short period of time? And you know, we spent you know, the, 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 the initial hours kind of assembling kind of teams to be able to respond. And then it was, you know, about half of our bank was focused on the PPP effort and, um, you know, use of data and use of, of technology tools. I wish we had a slicker system rather than a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of email and, and a lot of teams calls. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, we satisfied every client that applied for a PPP loan, um, but it was a lot of late nights. It was a lot of stress. It was a lot of angst for us, and and, and frankly, not the the client experience that a, that a typical Atlantic Capital Bank client has. Um, so there are certainly things that we are thinking about and and learning learning from, but. You know, at the end of the day, the job got done. Our clients are 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 funded through PPP um, funds, and uh, the idea um, of, of delivering government programs is one I hope not to have to live through ever again. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'll echo a lot of what uh, Nathan Ope said. That there, are, look, I mean, let's just be real. If we're, if we're being candid here, there's been a lot of problems with the PPP program. Um, I think there's been a lot of press around the banking response and who have got loans and was it, did they go to the truly intended people uh, that needed it from a small business perspective? And um, in, in some cases, in a lot of cases they have, in some other cases they haven't. So I think we should just acknowledge that uh, off the top, right? Um, I think from the truest perspective, and there's been some uh, news written about this specifically in the journal and other places that we have overperformed specifically to PPP compared to some of the other big banks about the amount of money that we're able to get into the market. Um, but that's taken a lot of work. And to Nathan's point, uh, we've had technology teams that have been working around the clock for a month and a half now at this point, if not longer, to make sure that they are establishing a process that is able to be effective for our clients. And I can even see on the Q&A, people asking specifically about, you know, how are we thinking about partnerships within that space back to your other question, Austin, and whether it's working with the Salesforce on helping to track our clients um, um, for the teammate perspective and the interactions they're having with them, or working with an Encino from a, from a lending perspective and make sure that we're able to open up that volume. We've had to seek out partners that were in the space that can help us accelerate this process. And then if, it, if I was going to tie it back to innovation, I think, you know, we there's a lot of mystery in general around how we define innovation uh, in our industry and broadly. But at the end of the day, it's people getting together, knowing that there's a problem and working collectively to solve it in a very short period of time in many cases. So that is what I feel like these teams have done probably at Nathan's at Atlanta Capital and at Truist where there's been a ton of good work in a very short period of time to stand up a very complex process. Um, and be able to pass through that money to the clients. You could certainly argue, I think, you know, if you're going to go back and think in time and have a conversation about why is the payments infrastructure in the U.S. level not more effective to be able to send funds directly to clients. Um, because at the end of the day, what we're geared and trying to do is make sure that people are not having to lay off their, their teams and be able to keep them employed. And I think we all um, on this panel and, and at Truist feel like that is just um, really important to do. One other comment is just kind of thinking through and, and you know, banks are good at rules. Banks are good at, at, at moving things through a factory and from a payments perspective. One of the challenges, one of the many challenges of BPP, it was a mass customization. So rules kept getting changed as you were trying to kind of work through the process and um, that is a challenging environment when you're trying to kind of deliver funds in a, in a, in a, a quick and, and efficient manner. And uh, the idea of mass customization um, 
doesn't work well in a, uh, a highly regulated, highly rules oriented kind of environment of which the SBA is. Yeah, thank, thanks to both Nathans. Um, Jonathan, I got sort of a two part question here for you because I think you've, you've you mostly answered sort of the first part, but you know, as a uh, you know, green light, since your client base tends to be families, teens, and obviously, you know, as you noted before, you know, for example, fast food spending dropping while video game spending increasing. But are you, you know, question part one, are you seeing any other sort of um, consumer spending or other sort of uh, behavior changes from, from, your, from your customer base um, that you attribute to, to the coronavirus? And then second, and somewhat related, we've got a couple people in the audience um, asking sort of a related question where you know, obviously your, your solution is meant to enable, um, you know, kids to, to learn to manage spending and, and budgeting and all of that. And so uh, our panelists knows that being home with their kids and all the volatility in equity markets, this has been a good opportunity to engage with, with the, the kids and, and family on that topic. And um, just wanted to sort of open up to you, if, you know, if you have any perspective there, green light sure. a, a role yeah, in a environment as well. Sure, a couple of things. Um, make sure I'm not on mute. We, uh, we have definitely been seeing a lot of adoption of features outside of the card. You know, I think when we launched in market about three years ago, it was a debit card for your kids and that was why you signed up. Um, it has become so much more than that with the savings goals feature and the parent paid interest and allowance and chores. And we're seeing like the vast majority of families are engaging with another one of those features, if not two or three of those features. So we're seeing that like accelerate again, which we love because it just adds so much value to the product and it, it shows why it's not just a debit card. Yes, if you want to go to Truist, you can get a debit card, um, but we're about kind of that holistic approach. The, um, it, it is public, so I can share that uh, we are launching very soon uh, kind of the next plan and the new feature on that, which is the, the brokerage account for kids. So um, parents can actually give their kids money to invest and then you can decide, do I want to let the kid just invest in, you know, free trades, of course, and let them just make all their trades on their own? Or do I want to approve every trade? So like the, my son would have to, to propose a trade to me and I would approve it and then we would execute the trade. And it would have, you know, all the things like fractional shares and everything else. But what is so exciting about that is what a great time for kids. Hopefully we get it out soon because what a great time to start investing. People ask us like, you know, what do you want? what do you, what's your, your Steve Jobs, what's your dent in the universe? And for Tim, Tim Sheehan and I, it is the idea that in 20 years, we will meet a kid who still has the brokerage account that they started investing in when they were 10 years old and they meet us on the street somewhere. And it's like, do you know that I turned that whatever stock into $200,000 and it completely changed my life? I mean, that is the kind of story that that we are building to. And so adding the investment account, I think is huge and what a great time. I mean, some days really hard, but most of the last 30 days have been really fun to watch our portfolios. So I, um, I'm, I'm just dying to get my kids involved too and, and hopefully uh, teach them how to research and look for trends and you know buy the right stock. And, and then we'll get into like venture investing later. I think, I think we'll do, start with public equities for the 12 years old. <laughs> yeah, it's probably. Probably a good way to start. Uh, Didi, you also, you touched on this earlier too, well, but um, it'd be great if you could expand on, on this at all. Um, so I, I know Allergen enables banks and credit unions digitally. So given the temporary closure of, of bank branches, and how have you supported your FI clients as they rely more heavily on digital solutions? Um, yeah, so, I mean, we support, we, we, we provide solutions in two different ways, right? One, one of our solutions is the deposit automation item processing solution, and the other is our digital banking platform, um, where we have um, a large uh, credit union base of, of customers who use, our, use that platform. Um, they've seen a lot of increase in their volume. Um, they've seen a lot of, um, I think Johnson said it, right? It's uh, that there's, that, that what's happening is an acceleration of things that were already in motion, but what they're starting to see is those age groups that really did not, did not feel comfortable, did not really have a propensity to want to kind of go onto the mobile app to deposit a check or um, go online to do something that they're, they're, they're having to get comfortable with that. Um, 
what they then are trying to do is capitalize on that for the long term. And, and because obviously it, it will create a shift in, in their operations to think about less, uh, less foot traffic. I mean, there's even, conver we, you know, I've had conversations with, uh, with some credit union um, leaders um, even yesterday just about um, an article that was written and, and we had a conversation about the fact that people aren't even going to ATMs because they're afraid of, you know, what might be on the button. Um, so all, you know, coronavirus is kind of uh, transcending through everything we touch, right? I mean, we talk, you know, people talk about, you know, contactless becoming more, nobody wanting to use cash because you have to touch it and then somebody else touches it when you hand it to them. Um, the same is kind of true with, with the digital banking and application and, and, and really the conversations we're having is about how, how, what are we missing? What is not in the application that we need that, that they are going to see as something that um, might be adopted faster because of the fact that um, that there is this 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 fear and this unknown um, with with the with the touch. Um, so for them and for us, it, it is a lot. Like I said, about being consultative with them, helping them, um, looking at their spikes, look, you know, helping them with 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 the volume surges that that I think everybody is seeing. I mean, certainly. Um, you know, a, I, a number of, of my, our credit union partners had big surges on the PPP front um, and given credit unions are um, much, um, they really consider their members family. So when PPP needed to be introduced, you know, they, they every single application they took very personally because those members are part of their family. Um, so they, you know, they, they took a very, uh, very strong um, um, you know, position on, on making it available. Um, I mean, popping up new, new pages in their, in their apps as quickly as possible to get applications through um, and really just shifting all of their resources to, towards those things and, and, you know, just hoping that the rest of the operations were just going to keep running so that they could um, answer to these questions and, and these, you know, these needs of their customers. Thanks, Didi. Um, sort of put a question to all of you. Have any of you seen any particularly creative solutions, whether your firm or others, um, addressing the new challenges posed by this public health crisis? And bonus points if it involves a collaboration between financial institutions and fintech, but that might be too much to ask. So um, i sort of open that up to anyone that might want to weigh in. I'm happy to start. I would say that I, I I don't have it on collaboration from fintechs. I'm sure Nathan or, or uh, I'm sure I bet Nathan does. Um, but for us, I think the the challenge and the, the biggest thing we've been trying to focus on is just the mental health of each other, of our team, right? And so um, we've been trying to think how can we engage. So there's been a lot of happy hours. I think there's been a lot of uh, Zoom bombing or dropping in of happy hours, especially when the engineers think theirs is private, but some of us can see into their Slack channels. So we like to drop into the engineering happy hours. <laughs> Uh, Greenlight actually did a talent show. We, we passed a, a good internal milestone of families like the second week we were all stuck in our houses. So we did a talent show and we had like 40 different uh, and it was mostly kids uh, doing the talent, but there were people. It was a whole family thing. Get a, get a cocktail on a Friday afternoon and, and come. And then uh, we're very excited. We have a big bingo game coming up next week. So everybody's gearing up for bingo. So I think that's been the most creative we've had to be is like just keeping everybody sane. Productivity has been through the roof, which is wonderful. Um, but at the same time, we can't just all sit there and work all day. We're going to lose our minds. That's great. Yeah. Anyone else? One thing I've been, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go for it. One, one thing I've been thinking about, and I kind of thinking back to kind of 08, 09 timeframe when the last financial calamity fell upon us. Um, it was a great time to be a fintech innovator. And, you know, the, the, the reason why it you know, kind of comes to mind is banks were very distracted on internal projects, loan workouts. They were thinking about themselves and not their consumers or corporate clients. So, you know, if, if I am running a fintech and I can see what banks and the distraction banks are going to have over the next 12, 18, 24 months. If I have tools or consumer facing applications, much like Johnson is doing, I think is a great time to, um, to, to take market share from banks that have historically had those relationships 
and um, maybe not invested in outward facing activities. What I'll add is I think that there has been a lot of stuff that probably does not get, um, um, it's not out in the news because there's a lot of, I mean, there's just a lot of um, legal hand wringing about acknowledging partnerships that are going on today um, in the banking space to help get the solutions out the door fairly quickly. So I think you'll hear much more about those partnerships post, you know, the next few months when we start talking about like the operational back ends and and uh, the effectiveness of things like open banking, the banks have started to in institutionalize and and uh, be able to scale with some of these fintech partners. Um, so I won't go into you know, too many details about specifically who we're working with and, and some of the things that we've seen, but just broadly, I think the fintech community has done a really important thing where a lot of their services, they've either cut the price in half or offered for free to their partners that they're working with to be able, I mean, obviously on their side, they're being able to interact in the banking industry at least with a large bank, whether it's us or Chase or B of A, um, but they're able to get their technology out there and prove it. And so it's almost accelerated their plan to market and allowed them to prove themselves almost immediately uh, with client interfacing tools um, that has would not have presented itself uh, if this had not happened. Now, still don't want COVID to happen, but I do think that that has been one of the benefits of the fintech space is they've been able to prove themselves good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah, Nathan, I think one of the questions we have from, from the audience here actually kind of ties on at least part of what you just, just touched in. So maybe we could, we could hit that while we're on that uh, topic. Um, question submitted anonymously, anonymously, but a little bit long, I'll read it. I have an FI client who's quite comfortable with technology in general, however, in a rush to meet customer demand, they had an opportunity to engage with a fintech to, to deliver PPP services. They decided against it because they thought the technology would deliver as promised, but they worried that the fintech might not meet the expectations of the relationship they had developed with the client, and they worried about letting the quote unquote camel's nose under the tent. So the question is, how does a bank ensure that when working with a fintech to solve an unexpected problem like COVID, that it still protects the key value proposition the bank has defined with its clients? I, I think that's always the challenge. I mean, I think in the past that that, I think, uh, and, and Johnson's probably run into this quite a bit with banks. There has been a risk tolerance in most banks that has been very conservative and wanting to control that client relationship has been for, foremost on the agenda, regardless of that end up leading to been diminishing returns on the client experience. So um, you don't really have an beta environment right now to go and test. You have to get things out the door. Um, so I think some level it comes down to their trust of the leadership and are you comfortable with them on what they are talking about specifically around what their solution will deliver um, is their level of trust, right? But the second thing is, uh, do you have a team that you can quickly stand up from a technology perspective that can vet whatever they're providing, the infrastructure, the code, things like that in a very quick you know, less than 24, 48 hour period to understand if uh, if it can start to deliver that. And some some banks have sandboxes that allow them to deploy that, others don't. Um, so really to me, it's a combination of, do you trust the leadership at the end of the day? It's probably not the first conversation you've had with them to begin with. And the second thing is really, is there a way to test uh, whatever solution they're getting out there? Nathan, know anything to add there? Or? Yeah, you know, the only thing I was thinking about, especially as it relates to kind of PPP, is it all hit so quickly. And so from someone kind of a, a bank like us, you know, we're not going to plug in a technology tool overnight to respond to kind of an immediate need. We're going to have to find, you know, existing tools that we are utilizing today to be able to kind of meet that client need. Um, rather than try to find uh, another vendor overnight to, uh, to satisfy kind of an immediate problem. Well, and I'll add one more thing yeah. to just think about that Nathan mentioned is that the data, so once again, we're such a regulated environment that 
rules around data and how we handle that, it, it, it dependent on what the solution of the, the provider is bringing to the table, we just have to be cognizant of uh, how they ultimately protect that. And if we make mistakes in that space, it, it will not only completely degrade the client experience and lose that trust, um, I think it, it creates barriers internally about being able to do anything down the road. Um, put one last question to the whole group and then we'll open up to any sort of Q&A. Um, but what do you all see as the long-term effects of this event? Uh, in other words, how, and how long do you think it will take us to reach some sort of equilibrium? Hmm. Maybe start DD or? Um, sure. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I, um, I certainly don't want to predict how long this um, might last, um, but um, but I do think that some of the longer term um, effects of it are certainly um, you know going to be about. I think the one the one thing we've we've seen we haven't really talked about here, but the one thing we've seen that even as um, uh, financial institutions have had to create more and more social distancing, obviously, from their customers and their members, and more and more has had to be transacted digitally um, and without, you know, with, without face-to-face. -face. Um, they, they're, what's still kind of, what we're, what we see still is sitting underneath all that is this desire for the financial institution to still be connected with that customer and that member. Um, and I think that, that, you know, the, one of the long-term effects of this, um, is going to be um, a there will be a further adoption of, of digital solutions. It's just going to happen. Um, Primarily, you know, partly because right now it's a necessity, um, and you know, partly because once someone does it once, we all know that once you you know you know deposit a, a check on your a mobile you know check on your mobile phone the first time, you find it's easy and it doesn't scare you to do it the second time. But at the same time. Um, the, the financial institutions um, and, and the customers and, and the members are still, there's still going to be this, this desire to be connected. And, and I think that will be a long term balancing digital and that connection is going to be a uh, long term something we have to, we have to solve for that's going, going to be, I think, a part of the solution. Um, I don't know what it is, but, um, but I can see that it's, it's starting to build and it's starting to, you know, create um, some some level of, of, of need inside of, of kind of that, um, that circle. Jonathan? Uh, that, that, you're not going to get me to try to answer that and predict how long this is going to last or any, any of that. I don't know what you think I'm going to fall for that. Well, then we'll just, just the first part then, just the, the long-term effects. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer, but I have just more questions about, um, honestly, this is more less about green light and just my family, but about education and, and the school system. I mean, we, uh, we're, we're quarantined with my sister-in-law and her three kids and then my three kids and both my wife and her sister are questioning whether they will actually go back to school. They're actually kind of, they got into their rhythm and they figured out their daily routine and, and they're kind of like, they feel like they're being slowed down by going with the teacher's plan. And now they like realize, I guess, what a lot of homeschool people have realized a long time ago, they can kind of go at their own pace. And, and now they're thinking about crazy things like homeschooling forever. <laughs> now I'm out if they're doing that. But it does, just, it does just bring up a lot, a lot of other questions about, you know, what, what else are we going to be questioning? And if you're, if you're going into crazy debt for college and and, and you're, you're having a hard time connecting because these big universities, I understand, are having a hard time getting professors online and doing some of this distance learning. I mean, I just think that's, that may be one of those things that, yes, it was already in motion, but it was at a glacial pace. And does this accelerate how we rethink, you know, higher education, K-12 education? Um, uh, I'm excited that maybe some really positive things will come, come from this in that other than my wife wanting to homeschool the kids. That's not positive. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Nathan O? You know, I'm an optimist, and um, I like to go into this with an optimistic tone. 
but I also see a lot of data and we work with a lot of payroll companies around the country. We are their bank and we are the moving money for lots of payroll companies. And we've seen significant drop off in transaction and dollar volume through those payroll company relationships that we have anywhere from 20% to 40%. And that means there's 20% to 40% people making less money or not getting money at all. And that <laughs> big hole to dig out of. And, um, um, you know, I, I am hopeful that science will find vaccines and treatments because um, that level of, of, of social discord can't last long. And, um, you know, it, it worries me looking at that data, being the optimist that I am. One other, one other point on, on that, and I was just kind of thinking about silver lining that, that kind of came out of, of activities over the last 30 days or so. And I think about the PPP process that our bank went through. We made more loans in three weeks than we'll make in five years. And so internally, when we talk about things, well, we can't do that because of blah, blah, blah. Um, you've got a marker within our organization to say, yeah, we could, we can do it. And we did. And so certainly the, 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 the nature of, of how you collaborate and the nature of when you have a common goal to get things done on behalf of your clients was realized. And um, I think that is certainly a sort of lining that we are talking about as an organization. And hopefully it'll push through other challenges that lay ahead of us um, in, the, in the coming months. Yeah. Nathan Meyer, what do you see as the long-term effects? Well, that's a difficult question. <laughs> I'm not, in no means am I an economist, so. Um, I, I think I do, you know, being in banking, do share some of Nathan O's um, concerns from the balance sheet impacts. Uh, I think all banks are seeing right now. Right now, you're at the high, you're seeing flight of capital into savings and deposits, which makes a lot of sense because we're taking them out of investment accounts because who knows what's going to happen with the market. Um, and I think it's going to be deep for an extended period of time. I, you know, we're seeing and looking at the panel, everyone on this panel has never experienced anything that has been this shock, this much of a shock to the economic system at the macro level. Not only what we're experiencing in the U.S., but what's going on in Europe and Asia. Um, and uh, what are we now, like 17% unemployment? I mean, it's, it's staggering numbers of a lot of people that are out there in pain. Um, and I think... Uh, that's just the reality and, and that companies like us need to continue to commit to helping provide liquidity to the communities that we're in and helping those people that are entrepreneurs and want to really uh, help address this market and continue to be really deep in thinking and getting product out there and getting stuff out there that they have a ways to do it and means to do it. But it, it probably is going to be a multi-year period that's difficult. Um, the second thing to tie on to what Nathan was saying about where we're going, I think that you are seeing obviously um, the digital, and, and Didi mentioned this as well, the digital migration for companies and, and whether you were going to be in that space and you wanted to have 1,200 branches or 3,000 branches in banking, well, that's, is that really needed after this? Have you really not serviced your clients just as well as you had in the past? I think banks are going to think about that. And then if you're just even non-banking, if you look at the companies that have really succeeded during this down, downturn, whether it's Amazon um, as a prime example, but anyone that is predominant in the digital space, they haven't been nearly as impacted by um, as many of our physical companies have, DoorDash, Uber Eats, I don't know, you could go down the list, right? So do you continue to have companies that think about their physical location and and whether they need it and what does that do to a large segment of our society that is in the service industry. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot to be played out here. There will be a shift to digital. I think it's going to take time to overcome. I think it will be overcome. It's just going to be um, a process. Thanks everyone. Well, unless anyone else has anything in particular they'd like to say, perhaps we can move to the any sort of questions we have here. Glenn, I don't know if you want to 
lead the charge there or sure uh and uh, if you haven't noticed already if uh, anybody who has a question i see there's a few that have already come in and we've answered a few along the way but there is a q a button at the bottom of your screen you may need to hover to uh, to have that actually redisplay uh, feel free and uh, we'll, we'll field those. I have one while we're waiting for a few more to come in. Uh, Nathan Meyer, you mentioned before that, you know, this is not really, a, you know, a situation that lends itself to a beta test environment. I'm curious, do you, uh, and this is for everybody, uh, both uh, the banks and the fintechs out there, uh, DD and, uh, and Johnson, Nathan, both Nathans. Um, do you think that given the circumstances, are you able to really push things out to the market a little bit more rapidly and expect people to be a bit more forgiving? Uh, do you think that there's, because of the circumstances we're under, that maybe there might be a little bit less of a, a level of uh, criticism if, if you do put out something that's not 100% ticked and tied? I mean, obviously with banking, you can only do that to some extent. Just curious of any perspectives on that. Well, just to be clear, not that uh, it's not a time for beta, you know, for for testing it's more of i think there's a lot of uh, banks big banks in particular and community banks that don't have that capability sure. so that was more of, more of the point um i don't you know looking at ppp and the response to uh, many of the banks i'm you know throwing something out there and see how the, how people are going to react i think uh we've learned that firsthand that it depends what business you're in i don't think anyone likes their finances to be messed up and so I think going back to the, 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 the stuff that we talked about earlier on, the conservative mindset in banking isn't there. It's there for a reason, right? I think we take, we really do take seriously our, our clients' financial well-being and their data and everything else. So there is a hesitancy to move things out there very quickly in that space that uh, may get a negative response. But that being said, this has really shifted us to realizing like, oh my God, we were able to get this out door out, out the door in a month or not a month. I mean, we were able to get this out door in days, out the door in days. Are there lessons learned that we can use this more effectively to get concepts out there? Maybe it's just a thousand clients and say, what do you think of this product or what do you think of this experience? And I think that will change how we work. And I also think it will change how we interact with our clients going forward. Um, yeah, I can, I also have a little um, bit of um, experience to share with there on that, Glenn, specifically just with um, what we've seen from a behavioral perspective of, of credit unions and, uh, and, and larger financial institutions, and actually more so on the larger financial institution side versus the credit unions. Um, recently, you know, we've still got customers going live um, throughout the last six, eight weeks. They, um, you know, early on in early March, when, when they needed to turn a lot of their resources internally, they put pauses on. Um, but then they've had to get comfortable with going live with upgrades or new solutions or migrations without having, you know, Allergen's team on, on site. Um, the things that never would have occurred six months ago, they never would have even pushed the green go button without five Allergen employees sitting around the, the button, making sure that it worked. Um, and now, you know, they're recognizing they have to if they're going to take advantage of the functionality that they that they need to get deployed out into the market or to their customers or even internal if it's a if it's a back office type of an infrastructure um, change. And and I think that 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 um, uh, that from a behavioral perspective, we're we're seeing it, which should bring um, it should bring solutions and, and efficiencies. Um, into the financial institutions faster because their, their, their timelines to get things up and running are not going to take as long when you don't need 10 bodies, you know, sitting there from Monday to Friday, eight to five for, for three weeks to, to say, yep, we tested it, you know, backwards and forwards and we're going to hit go. Um, and, and I think that'll start to, I think that should start to allow for more rapid deployment. Um, because I think the confidence is building um, in that, that they don't need all that that they thought they used to have to have. Thanks, that's, that's helpful. I, I just have to throw in an amusing aside. This is like real time example of everything that goes on in this new environment we're in. As you were giving that answer, Didi, the, the Amazon Prime truck just pulled up in front of our house. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, please don't come up our driveway, please, because then the dogs are going to bark and it's going to mess up this car. <laughs> and they did. And the dogs <laughs> stayed relatively quiet and I kept the mic on mute. But um, a couple of other questions. Um, actually, they seem to be coming out in a couple of different themes. One about how to work with, uh, you know, the, the distributed workforce in this environment. And then the other still a lot of interest on PPP. 
uh, Johnson and Didi with technology driving the change and you know the way we're working with fintech. How, how how are you working with continuing to bring talent into your organizations and managing your talent remotely? Uh, what kind of challenges have come up, and you know what, what have you learned about working with distributed teams? Uh, yeah, so at Greenlight, we are just super impressed with our uh, our IT team and the fact that it, it felt it was not without a learning curve, but it felt very, very strong. Like we, we were able to keep all the meetings already had a Google Hangouts or Google Meet link in them. So that didn't change. There's just nobody in a conference room that's linked to that Hangouts or that Meet. Um, the, the, the one challenge we had, it's kind of funny, was like onboarding new, we have a weekly new hire class. And uh, the actual problem for just about two weeks was actually getting laptops from Apple because they had supply chain disruptions. So we actually had a couple of, of groups of people that we set their hire date based on when we were gonna have laptops for them, which is a little bit embarrassing, but you know, it's like it pushed it a few days. Um, so the, the really the hard part for us was learning how to ship out. So we, we ship a new hire all their gear, um, they get it at their house and they, you know, their first day of onboarding is basically an all day new hire training, just like it would be if you were in the office with 30 minutes from key executives in the company. And, uh, it's, we're now into a rhythm and it's actually kind of fun onboarding people. It's the, the craziest part that I'm, I'm starting to worry about a little bit is since we've been out of the office, we've hired like 30, 35 people and we were already kind of full in the office. So where in the hell are they all going to sit? Are we all going to show up one day and there's going to be all these people just wandering around? <laughs> so, um, Nathan, uh, if you could help SunTrust make sure they accelerate our office expansion there. So <laughs> if, if, you, if you get Brandon back, I'll do that. <laughs> dude we're on a public webinar come on uh, so yeah i think i think again managing the team has been fine growing the team has been fine interviews have been mostly fine i think there are a few roles where it's a little tricky to interview somebody you know like key executives are going to be harder to interview on a video conference but software engineering ing interviews marketing interviews have been going just fine so that's that's been our experience so far it's the happiest news I've heard, the fact that you're still bringing on that many new people in the middle of all this, which I think we can take some heart in. Nathan's Did trying to steal else? them back. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we've seen the same, uh, some of the same stuff that, that Johnson just spoke of. You know, the, the first couple of weeks were, were difficult um, figuring out how, especially for, for anyone that was local to one of our offices um, around the country, um, if they were supposed to be local, how, how were we getting them a laptop? You know, did, did they want us to like stick it outside the door and they were just gonna come at eight o'clock on Monday morning and grab a, grab a package or mail it to them. Um, you know, some of the logistics took a little while when you weren't onboarding, um, but about a third of our company is remote to begin with. So, um, and are always remote. So, so it was just a matter of kind of changing the mindset to now everyone in the immediate term is remote um, when you're onboarding. Um, but I think this, I mean, I kind of echo the same thing Johnson said related to the resources. Um, interviewing and, 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 you know, uh, hiring, you know, marketing and, and developers and um, technology people has been, um, has really not, not really um, missed a beat. Um, but I think that the key, you know, key senior executive roles are going to be harder um, during this time when you can't sit, you know, as a leader, you can't sit across the table from them and have a conversation. Um, you know, Zoom and, and, and Skype and, and FaceTime are all, all great tools, but there are going to be limits to just what you get from, from that communication. That makes sense. Being respectful of people's time, I know we're bumping up on the top of the hour. One other, there's two questions I think have a common theme, probably more for the bank uh, participants. You know, we've heard a lot about, you know, the scramble to make the, the PPP loans and, you know, literally making like over a year's worth of loans within the course of a week or two. Well, that's just the origination of the loan. And now we've got the servicing coming up and it's not even necessarily standard servicing because we have to actually track these and figure out which ones can be forgiven. Um, any thoughts? I mean, is the fun just starting, <laughs> Nathan? Uh, and uh, Nathan Meyer, if you can uh, weigh yeah. in as well. Where do we stand on that? I think it is just starting on there. And, and this goes to kind of the, the partnership stuff. So I do think that banks will start thinking about who do they use to be able to continue the uh, handle that operational volume that they'll have long term. And so when we start thinking about what partners are out there in, in AI and ML that can streamline that process from what it stands today, which in many cases is manual, 
um, from a paperwork perspective at least, and be able to be fairly tied up and talked up so that when we need to provide something from a regulatory perspective or even be able to handle a client uh, interaction that we don't have a, a, you know, a similarity to what happened in 2008, 2009, 2010, where you had so much service in that the banks just did not do a good job with. So I think there are partnerships in that space that could be really um, effective. And then from just kind of the, the call center volume and, and things that we're seeing in that space, I think it's similarly, you know, if you have, if you move and transition effectively into the digital space, are there ways to be able to address those questions that pop up um, through mobile or online prior to them going to um, a physical person, right? And that's just continually improving that process and making sure that there's interaction points across the board regardless where the client and how the client wants to interact with their bank. You know, I, I, I think that's a really interesting question. And we we're talking about the forgiveness period being more challenging than the loan distribution period because you've made the loan, now you got to get your money back. And that's always a, a, a bespoke conversation. And until there is significantly more detail from the SBA around rules of that road, there, it's, it's still a question mark. But we have been thinking about, um, and this is kind of unusual for our organization, kind of outsourcing some of that activity to get our frontline people off of just talking about PPP 24 hours a day. And um, it you know, remains to be seen, but um, the idea of, of outsourcing some of that servicing, that's something we may do. Thanks. Austin, I'll, I'll hand it back to you to, to wrap up if you've got any more questions. I just wanna mention that uh, there will be, we have been recording and there will be a replay available. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming you'll get an email uh, after the, the session explaining how to access that. But uh, Austin, any other questions you'd like to uh, to throw into the mix before we uh, wrap this up? I, I do not. Um, certainly happy for our panel to weigh in with anything else they might want to say as we move by. But I just want to thank everyone, including Glenn, you, and Rebecca, and obviously our great panel. I think hopefully everyone in the audience got something useful out of it, and I enjoyed it. And you know, these are, these are crazy times we're living in. It sounds like, you know, we're all navigating it and, you know, there are opportunities and, and, and new things that, you know, positive things to come out of this. I think that's good. And with our panel. Thanks for having Nathan. us. Nathan. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Enjoy it, everyone. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Rebecca. Well, thanks, everybody.